Thirty Kiora, welcome everybody to this meeting of the Central Otago Council. And we will get underway with apologies. We have an apology from Councillor Shirley Calvert. Somebody move that apology, please. Thank you. Any second container, all those in favour? Aye. Against that carry. And we note that Councillor in the Claridge is on teams joining us remotely today. So it takes us to our public forum. First of our public forum guests this morning, Glenn Christiansen from the Central Otago Affordable Housing Trust. Derek Glenn, the floor is yours. Oh, good morning. Uh, look, I'm just uh, addressing the survey that, that went out and uh, we had a good number of respondents to that. Look, I, I think it speaks for itself. You've all read the report. You've all read the previous reports. Um, I think it really shows a need moving forward that we need to get this show on the road for the whole district when it comes to the affordable uh, housing. I note some comments in there regarding more work needed and to be done for the information. Uh, the information's out there. I think those people um, just haven't seen it. Uh, also, if we address the uh, slum side of things, unfortunately, that's people's lack of understanding in regards to affordable housing and social housing. Um, that is the difference uh, there at the moment. But I have a look at it, you know, it's very interesting when you see the percentage of people that, are, that support affordable housing actually have their own homes and live in their own homes in central Otago. And it's not a bad split between uh, and the Vincent. So I think that the time to make a decision um, and get it going is, is today. And that's all I've got for you. And I appreciate your time. Thank you, Glenn. We'll take an opportunity for any questions from Councillors Tamer. Uh, morning, Glenn. Hey, I just was having a look over the weekend. Kayanga Aura have got a first home partner shared ownership scheme. I just wondered if the Housing Trust knew of many people in our area utilising that model. No, no one. Uh, I'm not aware of that model full stop, to be fair, to be honest with you. So hasn't come to our attention. Okay. Hi, Glenn. It's Cheryl Laws here. Um, I will refer back to a question that I asked you um, last time you spoke at the public forum, only this time I'll phrase it slightly differently. I noticed that the Queenstown Lakes Affordable Housing Trust were putting out um, uh, for offers of interest to the five houses that they had in um, Wanaka. Now, bearing in mind that there will be probably more people than five that apply for those, um, and once it's been through the process of actually um, qualifying, what happens when there are more applicants than there are houses available? What is the process that you have or that the Central Otago uh, Affordable Housing Trust has to then choose from those that qualify to those that will receive those houses? Yeah, look, that's, that's a great question. We we haven't pushed forward to do a complete criteria. So what's happened is uh, the trust is made up of business people that have volunteered their own time and our time is limited. So we're really running on the same basis as the Queenstown uh, scheme. And unfortunately, there becomes a wait list. You, you just can't offer or uh, the, be the be all and end all to, to everyone. So the criteria will scale to make sure the right people are given those houses. Who are the right people? Sorry? Who are the right people? Well, the right people are the ones that are going to commit to Central Otago and, and the community and those that have community involvement and add to the community. So we're not looking for people that have lived here for five minutes and then want to look at uh, property. You have to be committed to the region. Thanks. Tamer again. I'm sorry, Glenn, one other question that I think you might have covered off last time, but refresh my memory. With the one third of gear of that amount of land, how many houses did you think that the Housing Trust might be able to provide on that? Uh, well, initially we started wanting to build 47 houses. Um, I haven't got that number off the top of my head from Kate today, um, but at this stage, we need to be able to scale. So five is the minimum start for the trust to be able to scale accordingly. Okay. And would that be in the vein of kind of what 
Queenstown have put it shot over country or more like those apartments that they've put at Frankton or you don't know yet? No, we haven't um, looked at that. It's all about economies of scale, being able to build. Um, and also we want them to, we want people to be able to take pride in, in their houses. So all of that comes back to when we were to go, if we were to go to the market and say to whoever, design these houses and bring them to us with one, what they'll look like. And also they have to, they have to be cheap uh, to run. So there's no point building a house that someone needs to go out and get 16 cubes of firewood to be able to run them. So there's a lot of work to do in that space uh, before we before we get that across the line. Thank you. Anybody else? <clears throat> Thank you, Glenn. Good one. Good luck. Thank you. Did we have time? Yeah, yeah, Excellent. Yeah. Next public forum, also online, John Brimble, uh, CEO of Sport Otago. Good morning, John. Uh, I've also got Dwayne Donovan, our Spaces and Places lead, along here with me, uh, who will also contribute. So what we're proposing, Council, is to work together with the five local authorities that make up the Otago region and the two community trusts who fund in the Otago region to develop and endorse a regional sport facility strategy that will provide a high level strategic framework for sport and recreation facility planning across the region. So it's a strategy that's designed to provide direction on what should be done and crucially what should not be done and to focus thinking at a network wide sports facilities level. And that has an emphasis on regional and sub regional assets while also capturing local level facility data. So crucially, this strategy is designed to combine the existing Queenstown Lakes District and Central Otago District sub-regional facility strategy, which both councils have been working to over the last few years, and have the same strategic intent applied to the three other territorial authorities that make up the Otago region. So that would be Clutha District, Dunedin City Council, and the Waitaki District Council, and we're going to call them Coastal Otago from, from here on. And secondly, then amalgamate the two sub-regional plans into one coordinated strategy covering the whole of Otago. So for the benefit of Council, um, the first stage covers the period 1st of July 2022 through to 31st of June 2023 and covers the development of a sub-regional coastal Otago plan that covers those three authorities I mentioned which will complement the existing strategy that applies to Queenstown Lakes and Central Otago District Council. So at this stage, if I can pass to Duane, just to provide some more detail on what the short, medium and longer term impact that this would have on Central Otago District Council. Duane. Kia ora, councillors. In terms of this regional plan, what we're effectively doing is leveraging what you've already done with Queenstown Lakes District Council in partnership and expanding it to the whole Otago region. It's designed to make wise investments and avoid duplication and oiling the squeaky wheel, if you like. In terms of your immediate implications, there is nothing that's going to change for you in the first year, even if you endorse what we're doing. You'll continue to work to the sub-regional plan you've already had presented and it makes no changes to what you have, are proposing and anything you're doing with your community. The plan is not intended to tie your hands. It's, it's intended to give you wise advice and long-term thinking so that the, the sport and recreation infrastructure develops in a cohesive way that is based on community need and not just who makes the most noise. So moving forward in years two and three, we will unify your sub-regional plan with Coastal Otago to create a wider Otago plan. And then with that document, your staff and yourselves will be able to make the best investments for Central Otago, but also with that knowledge of how it fits into a wider picture of all of the Otago region. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. Uh from you, uh, Mr. Mayor Thank and councils. Thank you, John. Um, 
councillors, questions? Yes, do you hear John? Um, it just sounds to me as that all facilities are going to be put in the big centres and that we small rural communities will travel a long way and regardless if they want to play sport. No, that's not the intent. Um, you'll still oh, have your own local autonomy to actually meet your own local community needs. It's just being more aware of what others are doing across the district, what's happening in Clutha, what's happening in Waitaki. Um, so that facilities that develop complement each other across the region. So when we're not looking to stifle growth in central Otago, far be it because it's the, it's the greatest growth area in the country at the moment. John, um, the, the merits are not to one side. What is it that you are wanting to get from this council? Is there a financial contribution? Is there a contribution of um, you know, pat on the back and go on your way. What is it that you're seeking today? What we're seeking through a memorandum of understanding that we've been discussing with your representative, uh, who's been Gordon, uh, on a working group, uh, is endorsement to actually work towards creating that overall Otago-wide strategy. So there's no financial implications for you, certainly for the last, for the next two years. Um, the only financial impact that could occur is when um, the Queenstown Lakes Central Otago sub-regional facility plan comes up for review, where you may have to look at investing a bit just to, to tweak and update that document. That's a, that's a wee way off though. Um, Neil Gillespie, John, um, that plan you just referred to, is that the one that QRDC or Central Lakes Trust did it. CLTC, CL, um, CLT, but not CLT. Not Central Otago, yeah. We, we, yes. we didn't contribute we didn't um, to there. Yeah. 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 We adopted, but didn't contribute. Yeah. Okay, other questions, councillors? Nice. Five minutes. <laughs> Wayne's not playing games on his phone. He's trying to make it stop ringing for the five minutes. Thank you, uh, guys. Much appreciated, John and Dwayne. Um, we'll um, follow through with Gordon and some other forum and find out uh, a bit more about it. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we have the pleasure now of having Ken Churchill actually with us. Welcome, Ken. Hello. Just to, to make you aware, there's five minutes speaking time, then questions. Start on the sit down. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well played. Um, like it. Unless you sitting. start talking while you're standing up. <laughs> it's not a seat at home, but it's sort of getting a bit like that. Well, worship and the councillors, <clears throat> I uh, wish to speak today about the Wild and Conifer Control. <clears throat> policy, which is uh, has an effective date on the July 2, 2022. I just want to try and tie it up to what's been going on in the area generally. And there's a couple of points which um, I find a bit disturbing in terms of procedure and the community boards uh, have a wee shunt out to the right and I'll get to it. I don't know if Wayne can put page 395 up at short notice, but it doesn't matter. Um, we've got them in front of us. So we'll uh, good one. Well, I have two. Uh, it's about the flowchart primarily. All the rest, well, I guess it'll get, I don't know how a document like this comes about clearly without consultation with the public. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the plan, and my good friend here, Martin, will be interested in that, I would imagine being on a community board. Uh, it starts off by with the council including the funding etc. In the tiny little box it's got public consultation. It doesn't say who, with or what that forum is. Then the council make a decision. Then it comes down to the officers who develop the work plan to, to, to implement the funded program. Um, in the case of the half mile I'd say that's absolutely waiting to go from last October. Here's the disturbing bit. Then it drops straight down to the implementation of the work plan, obviously. But here's the rub point for my money. Out to the right, inform only the community board, Martin, adjacent neighbours, and a notice erected on site. Now, 
I don't care what people say, but it was interesting what Stu said about another matter about <coughs> people out in the boondocks missing out on stuff. Once you take the, the community boards out of some of this decision making, that's shocking. That's the go to for the public and the ratepayers. So the community board, according to this flowchart, has the same integrity and the same status as a notice erected on a site in the adjacent neighbours. I find that absolutely shocking, shocking. But anyway, that's that's the way it's going. So it seems to me this council, that council, seem to be have uh, when it comes to meaningful consultation, seem to be averse to it. Averse. I don't know if I've got that right. That's the distinct impression I've got since last October. If I was a duly elected member of a, of a community board, I would absolutely find that flowchart, particularly the bit, an absolute slap in the face in terms of taking information from all the locals. I was going to say out in the boondocks, I don't mean that, I mean from the hot wider community. You know, it's easy to come along here when you live in town, uh, but when it's community boards, it's a wee bit different. The other thing is, when you tie this up with the half mile survey, which is a bone of contention with me because of the leading questions and bias in it, <coughs> uh, my good friend Chris Wind has asked for that information. It's been declined, there's no response. Out of frustration, not out of frustration, I've asked for that information under the Official Information Act, no response. No doubt the council or whoever it is will run me right out for the 20 days. Then I'll probably have to go to the Ombudsman to get anywhere, but I've done it all before. It's not a new thing. So these things are they're disturbing. They're disturbing. I know in, in, in terms of the overall district, when there's $10 million overrun on the waterworks, a few trees at the half mile, probably nothing. Depends who you are and, and what view you take on that. And the other thing is that um, there's a lot of people with, you know, way more legal understanding than I have in terms of um, Acts of Parliament. If you look at the Reserves Act and you look at Section 41, this council has absolutely thrown their nose at Section 41, which says every reserve shall have a management plan. I've had it, I wrote to the Minister of Conservation, reply via DOC, they administer that act and they concur with me and I have all the emails, I haven't got them here. You shall, and of all the people, Mr Mayor, you all know what the word shall means in legal terms, doesn't mean maybe, could be, let's wait five years, rah, rah, rah. it means you will. The management plan for a reserve gives the public another opportunity to have consultation. And it doesn't matter whether the reserve's a small one like the Waipiata Reserve or Seaton Square or Kamaka Walkway. They're just not done. And why haven't why hasn't it been done? So fair question, Ken. It's a hell of a fair question, and I'm, I'm going to run out of time. It's five minutes now, so oh bugger! But you know, I no, knew that would happen. First question time. Oh, yeah, I don't think I'll probably get any. Well, well, it depends on what people think. But that well, it's off the screen now. That that is a shocker. That is an absolute shocker, and I can see why. Oh, sorry, I'm going on. That's right. So, students, people have formed a group called the local democracy whatever and up until recently i thought oh they're the tin tin foil brigade but are they are they sorry i've got well, I, I don't question for you i'd argue that that process actually is up around your public consultation because as a community board member and a councillor and trust me in my community or in our communities the whole essential they will tell you where the issues are so you know while it might look in a format that way will be well and truly the community board will be well informed and will be making recommendations as we do as Martin gets told every day by community board members. So I, I, I do agree that it looks like it's the last place and community boards have no say in the matter, but in the reality, well before that council decision, the community boards have been engaged. So I think just... I mean, I, I, I've grown up in the, in the electrical trade and I know what flowcharts are yeah. and I know what the words are you write in it. 
That's what I said. And my, what I said, who, who's in there? Doesn't say. It, it doesn't say, Stu. Yeah. Does it? No, no, and something like this, and definitely we do get uh, input, but it's sure. on that chart looks like it's a bottom end. But it yeah, in reality, it's not. Absolutely, but yeah. Joe Bloggs, who, yeah. who's concerned about stuff, and there's a lot of concerned people out there, believe it or not, they picked that up like I did. Yeah. I don't know who drafted it. That may need a redraft, but it, probably not because it's been adopted, it's effective in the lives. <laughs> it hasn't been adopted, no, just to be clear, it's in front of us. I did it not. or not today. I could be talking in a vacuum, but I know how things go. Well, rubber stick. So no, no, I, I, I resent that. Um, this, this, this is a, this table today for us to make a decision about. You've provided some good feedback for some issues in the plan you think are relevant, and we'll take them into account when we make a decision. There's no rubber stamp involved here. No, no, okay. I, I, I should retract that if it's a bit sensitive for folk. But it's not um, sensitive, it's just not correct. Well, okay. It's uh, through the questions, councillors. I'd put that in quotes then for you. Right, thanks, Ken. Yeah, Appreciate your time. That wild and fine paper is. Approximately due to come up at not me out anyway. Three, 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 five ish. If you want to watch online, uh, can you come and look, sit in here? Here? No, no, no oh, I can't. Watch online. You can watch online. It makes no difference. Well, it does to me because I can't pick that. Um, right. Okay. Right. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks for coming today. Appreciate your time. <laughs> right, councillors, to page seven of the agenda, which is our next. Item, which is the uh, minutes of our last meeting, Wednesday 1st of June. There's no issues with those. Would somebody like to move those to be a true and correct record? Thank you, Taylor. Seconded, Martin. All those in favour? No. Against. Okay, so that's carried. Declarations of interest. Members are reminded of the need to be vigilant to stand aside from decision making when a conflict arises between their role as a member and any private or other external interest they might have. How are we going with Finley? Um, still uh, nothing yet. We should be able to Yeah, we'll just work our way along. Um, <coughs> keep moving, unfortunately. Well, hopefully, we will get in touch with her, and you'll let me know, of course, when that happens. So we now hand over to Rodan, Councillor Duncan. Yeah, thank you very much. And I'll put up Quinton. And that's it. Twenty-two point five point two provision of temporary bridge structures. And uh, yeah, that's a good call. Thank you. I'll take the report as it's been read. So a report was presented at the 1 June 2022 Council <laughs> meeting and that directed staff, the resolution directed staff to investigate and report back at the July 2022 meeting on options and costs for a temporary Bailey bridge to be installed at the location, Money of Todzota Road, Tidery River, Bridge 145. This included opportunities for a cost share with the adjacent affected landowner to be investigated. So installation of the temporary Bailey bridge would allow the route to be reopened in the short term and would provide um, time and um, better distributed available funding across the Brenton Bridge Network to allow for the assessment of all Central Otago District Council's bridges and the development of a strategy for mural work to be undertaken in the 2022-23 year along with the Walker Kotahi funding application for 2024. So multiple options for the hire of a Bailey Bridge have been explored and it has been determined that the Bailey Bridge fire service offered by Waka Kotahi is the most suitable option in terms of cost and level of service provided. The total one-off cost for bridge establishment and disestablishment is approximately $200,000. This includes geotechnical investigation and design, preparation of the launch pad, abutments, approaches, transportation to location, erection of the bridge, installation of running planks, and then dismantling costs in the future. The ongoing hire of the bridge is 4,400 per month or 52,800 per annum. Um, I've been in discussions with the adjoining landowner who has agreed to a 50% cost share for the period of three years for the ongoing monthly hire of the temporary Bailey Bridge. The total cost to council for the three year period is 279,200 with 79,200 of that being met by the adjoining landowner. Um, so the recommendation um, before Council today is around approving the installation of the temporary bridge subject um, on the condition that the adjoining landowner funds half of the cost of the monthly rental for a period of three years and direct staff to formalise that agreement. I'll hand back to the Chief for any questions. questions. Is that a good use of $279,000? 
Um, on the basis that there is a cost share available, it does make it a um, more cost effective option and it would allow the reopening um, of that route. And there is budget available for this piece, as well as progressing that overall bridge strategy and then coming back um, as part of the um, long term funding plan application with Waka Kotahi. So um, it can be um, met by the current budget. My oh, biggest more concern is that is it a good use of money? I mean, would, it be, would we have been better to spend the money on building something? That would go very far in terms of building a permanent structure there, and this gives the, the time to understand the full picture. Um, not noting the fact that this bridge in the future may or may not be replaced, mm -hmm. it does provide a placeholder until such time as a decision can be made around the future of all of Central Otago's bridges. Okay, so it's a stop. Okay, as you're as I'm sorry. Um, so I've got a question. The establishment, the geotech work, investigation, design, and launch path, are they will if in time there is another bridge goes there, will they be able to use as a part of the cost offset of a new structure? There'll be some efficiency in the work, but it's it's largely not. Um, it's going to have to be geotech. Geotech will do that one. Yep, there's there's some parts of that work, um, but another large portion of that's also getting the bridge from its current location to here and the installation of that. I was just going to ask, um, bearing in mind that you know it's got to be replaced, and you are going to do a, a you know an assessment on the the bridges. Wouldn't it be better to just wait and actually then replace it? When you are ready to do it, because we have the long-term plan. That's that's the decision. So there is the option to not um, provide a temporary daily bridge, and that is an op that is one of the options as as presented um, in this report. Um, it does have a significant effect on um, landowners in in that area. How many uh, owners are there? Um, it's a main thoroughfare. Is it from one end of the Mini Tata, but it's a long way from several and one's been cut up completely half as far one way but it's a lot of people have got to go the other way to come back so it's it affects a lot of people but one landowner a lot but that's his and i believe there are seven to eight other landowners yeah. directly affected by this um but as as you speak to it is, is a thoroughfare um but one landowner the landowner who's willing to contribute a 50 percent cost here um does farm both sides of that and has additional costs in doing that things. Um, well, so I've got one and I wasn't at the last council meeting, so I may be going back over something. Um, if you're starting with a blank sheet of paper and you're building your road, is this where you put your bridge? I probably can't answer. That, that question directly there. That's a good answer, though. Yeah. That the answer is answers don't know. Question. Well, I guess it's historical. Old bridge was, was originally a, a wagon lane yeah. from the sticks to Naseby from the early days, and there are alternative routes, but they both there's only two crossings of the river and the over there. So it's where it is is quite significant, but it also it splits a whole lot of country through that part. And and it's one of those bridges that a lot of people make comment about. And for emergency services to go to the house that's across there is 40 minutes extra to get back to there. So it is, and it's, we can't call it a heated discussion. I think I the answer would come from there. We've, we've, we've got the budget now, but if we have another one somewhere else in the Minnetota or somewhere else in the district that blows out, we might not have the budget and we just have to have that now and we'll be prepared that we may have to find the budget. and. Much better that we go down the strategy route, but we haven't had a hundred year flood in the last 18 months. You know, there must be due one. <laughs> so, um, just wash it now. I touched wood, you know. Same for flutes, not what it's placed it. But, you know, that, that's <laughs> what we have to have in our mind is we, yes, we've got the budget, but of course, once you've spent the budget, it's gone. And I guess that is another issue that we have got a half million dollar road in emergency budget from brick for those things to come up with. But bridges and infrastructure are major important. And one thing is a showing that we're actually dedicated to moving towards that process as the first step in the hurdle. But if I know other questions, I'd like to summon the move recommendation to receive the report accepts significance. Um, I'll second it. 
moved by Martin. Second by Tracy. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Thank you very much. And it's going to be a long process of bridges and equipment. I'm sure it's going to do a pretty good job. It's a pretty task it will start and elect the members. Absolutely. Hopefully we're getting this slow week. Right. Would be B and C. A, B, C. No, I'm just checking if it was A, B, C because he just said A. Oh, no, no, sorry, A, B, and C. Okay. Um, 22.5.3. Internal road stop on Zlinda. Welcome. Hi. Good morning, So my first report, uh, first report today is about internal road stopping and the purpose of the report really is to seek some clarity for staff regarding um, the policies uh, that we have in place, um, including the um, roading policies. So at the, uh, this, this, this came about at, after um, the Cromwell Community Board meeting in March, um, where a paper was presented recommending that um, a section of Malmoor Terrace be stopped um, to enable the construction of the hall over a larger parcel of land. Um, so after the, the report was left to lie on the table and after the meeting, the um, chair of the board uh, contacted the CEO to um, ask for some clarity regarding the matter. And um, the main concerns raised by um, the board chair were that um, the existing hall site is um, quite challenging in front of Melbourne Terrace because the building is built right up to the road um, boundary. Um, but they, that they, uh, the board understood that there are a lot of benefits in purchasing the road to increase that footprint and um, to be able to develop the site to its maximum potential. Um, but the reason that the report was left to lie on the table was because boards effectively cannot own land, but it is owned by council on their behalf. Um, and so the um, main point um, that they wanted to be uh, clarified was that uh, the board would be effectively be buying council land as the council from the council but couldn't own it and would um, be effectively the hall committee um, paying council $500,000 for something which they could not own. So we do have some examples in the past where we have um, uh, effective road stoppings and the land has been gifted effectively because it is um, has been stopped and amalgamated with um, council land and the purpose of that has been to facilitate the construction of, um, for example, the Rockstra Pool, which was previously um, split over two titles, one belonging to council and one belonging to um, the education ministry. And the stopping that we effected there enables the new pool, community pool to be built on one title of land, um, which um, and, and not involve the, the education ministry. So um, other examples of that are actually coming up um, next and um, more recently at um, the council meeting um, earlier this year, we agreed to stop a part of the road that was previously known as Boundary Road um, and to develop it into recreation reserve with walkways and um, uh, that type of thing on it, which is the same as the Flora Street proposal. So council stopping road for the purpose of council for the benefit of the public. Um, and when you um, look at the uh, roading policy, the roading policy starts with a sentence that it is um, used to be used for the purpose of administering public road stoppings. Um, so what we wanted to do today is clarify that if council is stopping road for the purpose of council or the wider benefit of the um, public, does that roading policy apply whereby the land will be transferred at valuation? Or can we then um, treat it as a, an internal road stopping and transfer the money that uh, transfer the land that is for the benefit of the public and the council or the a board or a community group, um, such as the Rocks Report Committee, um, at perhaps um, nil or a reduced price. Um, but the recommendation today is that if it is for a public wider public benefit, that we um, transfer that land at nil subject to whichever um, cost centre is uh, once the roading um, road stopping is affected, paying those costs such as survey um, and of course there'd be no valuation fees, but there'd be legal and uh, lens accredited supply out. Right. Discussions. It makes sense. It's pretty straightforward because why penalise ourselves? We're robbing, you know, 
be clear case of you know we're robbing Peter to pay Paul. It is and it isn't. In the, and I'm not arguing the counter argument, but the counter argument is that the rest of the district pays interest to Cromwell on money. So is the and I'm not arguing that. I'm saying that that is a counter argument. So it may not be just as simple as it first was. I think it actually is good as you go back and look at the history of what we've yeah. done and we've digitalized things and we've changed things. Um, the bigger picture stuff um, doesn't really come into it. Um, and the key thing about this is saying that the land's all councils anyway. Yeah. Council can decide to what a flipper will like. Yeah. At the end of the day, we've got delegations going to go into a community board that provide for certain things. And if the delegations are going to um, uh, bring about outcomes that the community, which is the council, wants, then we're actually penalising the community. If yeah. you do it any other way, yeah. if you add to the cost of of and, 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 this is coming up first because Flora Street's next. Yeah. Flora Street sat in our district plan for the big thing to be closed for years. And the issue about being closed is never about money. It was always meant to be a green one. That's why it was put in there in the first place. Um, so for all intents and purposes, this is making sure saying we should do it on a case by case basis for cost and for um, sale price, and that's the right thing to do. And, and to clarify, that's my feeling as well. I was yes, just yeah. Pointing I thought, out that there could be a counter. You're playing. I didn't mention the loaders. This one question, yeah. Stu. It does. I, I, I get A and B. I'm just wondering whether C is enough in this case because we're saying we're going to deal with it on a case by case basis, but we're not actually in the, dealing yeah. with it in this case. Is that? Is oh, it? There's is another it, report coming about the, the case. No. In terms of the front of the town hall in Cromwell, yes, which will come in the future. Yes, yes, oh, yeah. Yeah. It's sitting on the table of the community board. Ah, yes. In fact, so, I don't even think you need to see because nothing for the chief executive to do until well, she gets one. I was wondering what that. that it's like not doing any harm. Being right. So, what do you see in there? For, just in case, is anything you have to do, or do you can you envisage that you need to do anything here other than nothing? This point. Some signing of stuff. It'll be on the individual case by case basis. So remember, so it would be subject to um, the recommendations in a report that was analysed on that case by case basis, and whether it was an internal or an external um, rate stopping. Because this is not, this is we have no desire to not charge the public unless it is perhaps oh, stopping right. and taking and it's the trading off. But um, I remember why I put my note there. Yes, and that's the. Is there a lack of clarity there that each of these decisions needs to come back to council? We've got a C that says that authorises the C. Sorry, it, it will still come back to council, but um, the difference is, and it will start at the board as previous. So the next yes. step, if, if you if this was approved today, for example, then I would be going back to the Cromwell Community Board's next meeting, and I'd be saying this report will to while well, we sought clarity. Can we just add them and B? Um, matters relating to costs to be considered on a case by case basis by the council. council. Yes, by the council. Just going to say that was ah, yeah. okay. And then C stays in the basis that this can be given effect to the resolution. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'll leave it subject to those amendments. Yeah. Yeah. We'll second that. I'll do that. Tim. All those in favour? Okay. Aye. 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 Against? Carried. Thank you. Right, and on to 22.5.5 on pay 78. Flora Street. Flora Street. Yes. Um, so yeah. the Flora Street road stopping, as we just discussed, has been sitting around for quite a considerable period of time. And it just had not been um, affected uh, as such. So we took a report to the uh, Cromwell Community Board and they have um, agreed to support um, the proposal and have agreed to recommend to council that uh, the road be stopped um, and bested um, in accordance with the way which it is used. So um, rather than road, it will become a reserve and it will be protected um, through rafter for the purpose in which it has been developed. Thank you. Yeah, questions? So I'm happy to move. Second that. Cheryl. Move Martin, second by Cheryl. All those in favour? All right, thank you. Yes, Karen, thank you very much, Linda. Lovely, thanks, Chris. Well, speed limit changes. Oops. Let's see the end. We're bringing the recommendations from the hearings panel on the speed limit changes for finalisation today and they would, would go into effect from the 1st of August at one minute after midnight. 
I would first brought this proposal to the, next, the March meeting and then out for consultation immediately following. When we brought that item up, we're aware that legislative changes were making their way through government as a new land transport rule setting the speed limits 2022. That process had been underway for several years and delayed on several occasions. And so instead of waiting to bring speed limit changes under that new legislation, we brought them under the old approach, knowing that we could move into the new approach underway if they came into effect. That's the same reason why we set out these state school speed limit changes, because there were changes on this legislation as to how we set that, whereas the other pieces could smoothly move from one to the other. <coughs> now, with that legislation now in place, we'd like to move from the old bylaw process into the new National Speed Limit Register process today, as well as pass the changes. That largely is an administrative change that's managed on the staff end, so it won't have any effect on the public or the need for consultation or any of those factors but it does make it easier to show what the course are here that we're complying with legislation and at the auditor first. So there's some benefits and it also makes the changes easy to see because it's like a digitised process. <laughs> Onto the changes themselves. So consultation was open from the 11th of March to the 12th of April. We had quite a wide reaching engagement campaign with media articles, print advertising, radio advertising, and social media promotion and we use paid boosts to increase our reach as much as possible and we also need to thank members for using their channels to help us reach a wider audience. We have about 1900 web participants, um, that's people who viewed the project page and that translated into 207 written submissions with a further 19 oral submissions at the hearing on the 7th of June. There's a relatively high level of support for the proposal. We had 37% of respondents supporting it in full and 43% supporting it in part. We have 20% of respondents against the proposal. Uh, so the, the panel made up of councillors Duncan, Patterson and Ellie considered all of the submissions and have recommended a total of 24 changes to the original proposal. 23 of those changes are the direct result of submitted feedback, one is a technical adjustment. Eight of the recommended changes will require further consultation to be carried out under both the Local Government Act and our Significance and Engagement Policy. That's because these are areas or locations that weren't considered in the original proposal, so the community haven't had a chance to put their input forward on those. Um, and you will see in the recommendations that Pearson Road and Sand Flat Road fall into both areas. That's due to the recommendation by the panel that we consult on those again in context with the other changes suggested for Bannockburn by the community. So we've put them in both places to enable that to be carried out. Uh, and that will be packaged together with the school speed zone consultation to take place later in the year. It can't happen during the pre-election period and it's likely to have not the highest engagement over Christmas. So it will be as soon as we can get the right date range essentially. So to summarise, um, we're seeking approval for the package of speed limit changes to take place on the 1st of August and to repeal the existing bylaw and move into the new process and to note that further consultation will take place. Thank you. Any questions? It was quite a long thorough day to be fair and I had some very good help as the council Patterson Alley and we, yeah, it was a long day. No, I have a question. So when you're looking at the maps that were attached and the, and the speed limits that have been imposed over the, the roading maps, so I was looking at the rocks for east and I know that there was always uh, quite, a, quite a lot of push for 80 k's from Mills Flat all the way to Lake Oscar Village, but it looks like you've just done a small section. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah just where just where the build out here is and make the open road. And, uh, and there's quite a lot of people who were not so much on over some of them wanted to keep speed limits at the levels they were at. Um, yeah. yeah, but the only concern I had about that is that yeah, while under normal circumstances it's um, probably okay, but the reality is that every time there's a blowout and the rain event on the hill and there's the highway. Everything's to build it over the North Slope Bridge and up that back road, and then it's an off price. Such, such a good area. So just and stuff about that, though, for the, for the third time. Does it become the responsibility of Wapakotahi if it's become a highway? 
Hmm. But the highway is deviated, does it become the hmm. We would work with Walker Katai here on the appropriate signage and everything through a diversion through that. The traffic day, wouldn't it? Correct. And um, just to note, um, that change was recommended based on uh, driving the route and um, specialist feedback from um, a traffic engineer from the Miller's Lake to the point it does go because um, there is a section that is um, 80 kilometres from um, a long TV road south from Roxborough yes. um, and then from there onwards through to the Miller's Lake end. Um, that recommendation come from both um, staff engineers driving um, and understanding what that road can be driven at yeah. um, safely, as well as specialist advice from um, traffic engineers. So just to follow on from that diversion, is there, is there any likelihood that what the car would then uh, put in their own speed limits if it was a diverted road? Is that a possibility or that's our need? It's not any good. That would be managed through it. If there was to be any adjustment, it would be managed through a temporary traffic management um, plan. Um, so it would depend on the situation. Okay. Might be that if the state highway was diverted along that road, it's an 80k zone for the duration of it would, it the would diversion. Depend, it, would, it would depend on the situation um, and what was assessed at the time. Can I give you an example? Shortcut road over the roundabout construction mm -hmm. is normally a 50k road. Past that, we'll put down the 30k as part of the diversion of Waka Katoe, put in both. So their traffic management plan covered our road and they put a lower limit on the, coming into the corner, the shortcut road, um, from 50 down to 30. So, um, yeah. So I guess they may, yeah. Yeah. if they choose. Yeah. Anyone else, any other yeah. questions? Yeah, the trouble with these things is that you see some things after we've done all the hard work. Um, and, and I've got to say that there's, I think there's an issue in Clyde. Um, the 30k off the bridge to 50k and extending that area and then to an open speed limit. I think that's something we need to watch, but I think, you know, I, I'm sure I've heard what Katoe tell us that going from open road to 50k is not a good practice. And do I say on one of the roads that's probably used to that, it's going to be hard to get people to button off, but the sentiment makes sense. But I just so you're talking about the Hawks Burn? No, no, oh, well, yeah, the North Burn turn off that from section through there and you came out past Picnic Creek. Yep, um, there, there is always challenges going from yeah. 100 to 50 in terms of that transition and get to coasting through, um, but we are looking at um, the rules with Waka Tate and, and signage around what that transition looks like. Yep. Um, and, and having, it depends on distances and can you see the speed limit yep. and what the signage actually looks like, um, depending where it is located um, between there and the bend. And if there is good visibility, um, to the signage, you can have appropriate signage, or you can have a um, 50 kilometres and 200 meter like appropriate signage to try and manage that transition. I know there's a there's a certain large fleet of large fleet fleet operator that has their vehicles all um, through our VMS system, and the most um, one of the most common pings they get is that people come off Fruit Road Road and turn right and go up through the 50k area, and they hit the open road speed limit before they get down to the 50k because they go out there. So that's mm -hmm. that's just. And that's, yeah. Um, the other one that is Lake Roxborough um, in the dam. Um, if I'm reading the map right, can I just clarify the way that's going to work is that you'll come off the state highway and turn left into a 50k area into Tamron Drive. Is that what the way that, what that map's showing? Over the dam, isn't it? Um, well, yeah. So well, Roxborough East Road is yes. open road. No, but you come, when you come into the Roxborough Dam off the state highway 8, yeah, you turn left, that's going to be a 50k area when you hit that Tamlin Road drive. Uh, that's not Tamlin, that's Roxbury East, is it not? Oh, OK, it does. It's a big button, it does start at Roxbury East, so it's going to start at 50k's. I believe that's open road. That's open road. So yeah, well, that just, just with the way the map looks like, it looks like it's going to be 50k's. OK. Um, I was wondering, I don't know how you want it, if it's too late, but once you get past, I'm on the uh, the turn off to carry on the Roxbury's road turning left. The open road speed limit probably just not appropriate to get up there and whether it should be brought back further. Um, that was in the original um, recommendation, but that was changed over here. Really? Um, I don't think it's a good idea. But I'll, I'll like to know. Um, so the consultation document proposed five speed zones ranging from 40 to 100 kilometre hours. Um, and it was, I believe the comments were around limiting confusion with multiple speed limit changes across there because it um, 
sorry, I have to get a copy of the original map um, brought up, but um, there was a change along Roxburgh East and then 40 across the dam, <coughs> then a, a 60 or an 80 um, through a section on the other side of the dam on Roxburgh East. <coughs> <coughs> All I'm saying is the way the map looks, it looks like you're going to turn up the highway, go into the 50k area, that's what the plan shows to me, doesn't show it as open road, and then you go back to open road and then down to 40. Yeah, so that might just be the map needs to be where the yellow area is brought closer to that Tangman Drive um, to show that difference. I just don't think it's appropriate to go off this that highway open road on it, but you can't do open road speeds to get on a 40 car at the top of the hill. It just seems ridiculous. Oh, we can't tell the dam. This way. No, you turn left. Turn down south. Yeah. Yeah. You go up to the dam itself, <coughs> and that's 40 k. But what you just told me, the road from the highway to there is 100 k road. <coughs> the highway at the start of Ross Dam 50, isn't it? Can we start off the state highway through there? It's um, classed as open road. Okay. I don't know what the yeah. The, I think this is the trouble with maps that you look at and go, it looks like it's going to be 50, um, but it's not going to be. And I don't know, Stephen's got a better, or Stephen comes from that patch. So, so just, just for clarification, that um, was an area where I took a photo there, I'm thinking, well, this one here needs to be pulled back a little bit. Mm. So, for clarification, the original recommendation from both the drive over um, and the traffic engineer um, was from the state highway turning onto Roxbury's Road, a portion of 60 kilometres until you reach the dam. So um, that first stretch from the state highway <coughs> to the dam at 60 kilometres, yeah. and then a section of 40 kilometres an hour across the dam, and um, then heading south from the dam um, for a section, um, and then changing to 80 kilometres past Gilmore Road Nobby Range Road until it um, goes into open speed limit. So there was multiple changes, um, multiple changing speed limits through that section. And the decision of the panel was to do away with that recommendation through the submission process and make it open road and just a section of 40k across the dam and then open road again. My understanding was around just confusion of multiple changes. Um, However, far be it for me to tell them they're wrong, but I think they're wrong. We, we did, how many submissions did we receive on that road? There was one in particular. I believe we had eight commanders either side yes. of that line. And most of them applied to the that other side of the dam, yeah. didn't they? Not that turn off that portion from the main road to the top of the dam. Because you just don't drive, you can't drive. You can't, you can't drive the system. So to yeah. me, just just because you can't, it's not a reason to make it so you can. And, and I would have thought that I'm, I'm surprised that the idea of going from 60 off the highway to the 40 car at the top of the dam is entirely appropriate. In fact, 50 would be even probably better. But no, do 50 anymore. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the 46. That was the, that was the yeah. problem that we had with a lot of it was that what would make sense for tying in with other roads in the area is no longer an available limit. 50 or 70 would have still been fine. But it's got to be 40, 60, or 80 before open road. And then that was that was a fair bit of the discussion was actually. All through central, you can go down where some place will be 40, some people will be 60, and some be 40 back down to 40. So, consistency was one of the issues. It was a big thing by, by people in the submissions and staff and us, I guess, at the end of the day. So, yeah. the purpose of the day, if I was to push and say, no, I should go back to the original recommendation of 60 from the highway to the 40k mark, have we got the scope to do that today? Yes. Mm. Good. But it will be. Because that is what was consulted on. Cool. So, it's yep. either what was consulted yep. on or yep. the current speed limit as of today. Um, if there was something alternative suggested, yep. um, that would be where cool. the future cool. comes from. Cool. Cool. You know, one other question then in relation to Radford Road. Yes. I think I read in the recommendation that that's to be 80. So, so it's one of more. No, uh, I thought it's one road. That was those roads up the back of Lothian, isn't it? Yeah, correct. Yeah. So that was in the document at 80? Or wasn't in the document at all? It was not in the document at all. It was missed from yeah. the document as it was not recognised as a it's just a, it's a pretty new it's a pretty new right, so that's probably one. Correct. Um but that that area um it had the 
eight and an eighty kilometer hour speed on. I want to go off the person that drove that road up at one eighty k. Yeah, because I shouldn't have a license. Correct, it cannot be done at eighty, but it was for consistency to Swan Road. Do you like the advice given on Rats for East Road at the time? It was submissions were received against the changes. One noted frustration for track drivers with the new approach, and the other the need for self responsibility on country roads. A further one submitted supported some of the reduction, but felt a reduction to 40 kilometres to be excessive. A further one submission supported the reduction to 80 kilometres across the but did not support the variation in lower speeds. Um, all further submitters did not support the variation in lower speeds. Two did not support any changes at Roxburgh East Road, and one supported the change but felt it should extend further with lower changes, and then there were four were requesting lower changes in other areas. But that's the whole length of Roxburgh East Road, isn't it? So it's a bit hard to say whether they're talking about the dam, and I'd suggest most of them weren't talking about the dam area. They were that. elsewhere. Then, just in terms of what Neil's talking about, Stephen, how much traffic? On bikes rides that portion of Roxbury Road because I know when I did that part of the trail, I started at Roxbury. The, 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 section, the section of trail we're talking about now, they do they come onto that. So you get if you were driving up that hole to go over the to that's drop down to the dam by 100, that's a hundred, that's a You've got cyclists coming off the um, and then uh, Roxbury Gorge Trail. If, if when you get that break in the Gorge Trail fixed, yep. there's more traffic there, so that that makes me lean strongly towards what Neil's saying that. Maybe we need to have another look at that, that one today, just that little bit. Okay. So we have that discussion now. Yeah, I, I think we can. I'm not sure that I totally, I just think 80 would have been quite appropriate. Neil thinks 60. So. Well, for that short section of the road, I can't see the point in making it 80 because it becomes a target. Yeah. Um, just as I know, 80 would require further consultation. Yeah. Um, no, 60 is an easy fix because it's really consultable. 60 is actually consultable. No. The, the, the difference in, in time to get from point A to point B with nothing in front of you between 60 and 80 would be a matter of seconds over that yeah. degree of road anyway, wouldn't it? Well, that, and, and the comments about potentially not being drivable and <laughs> have that speed. Any other discussions? But just so that we're clear, we're talking about the turn off on, on the way so south. So to the dam. Yeah, to the dam. So you say 60, road. instead of open road, we're turning, turning it into 60. 40 over the bridge, yeah. which remains, yeah. and then 100 over yeah. until yeah. you hit like, the next yeah. stage. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. 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 Right. So how do we go here? So we'll, so this stage, move to some move and receive report. A, B, C, D, E with the Roxburgh East to the dam changing to 60k. Yeah. And then what would it stay on the other side? Pardon? I said, and I'm just writing up a thing, would it stay at 100 on the other side? Yeah. Okay. If the right subject to consultation, we don't want to put it that then, no, no, that's fine. So if we go through that again, someone would like to move A, B, C, D, and E with the change. Oh, if. Okay. Place to move that. General second that. Any more discussion? Who was the second? That's right. Okay. No. Okay. No more discussion? Thank you. All those in favour? Okay. No. Those against? Carried. Thank, thank you, thing. Stu. Thank you. To, uh, just, it, was a, it, it was a big day. It was going to be a lot of input. The staff did a very, very good job of day. It was, Thank you. Thank you to those councillors who got that task on. Before we go to Nigel and Three Waters and Waste, I have to take us back to the minutes. Um, I misread Martin's face when I thought he was indicating he was seconding the minutes. He wasn't because he wasn't here for the whole meeting. He was trying to indicate that he couldn't. So Tamer has moved the minutes and I'll second them just to move us along. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. All those against? Carry. And um, it's only more than embarrassing. Over to you, uh, Lindsay. Um, Lindsay's back with us. Lindsay at Lindley's been having trouble, but great to she's back. Welcome, Lindley. Nigel, all yours. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, three waters and waste, item number 32.5.6, request to take over private water supplies, and we have Ian to talk to you about the use and duty. Thank you. 
but yeah. there's a way of finding at the moment, so it's not being as easy with the services. Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, so look, I'll take the report as read and just touch on um, a few key points. Obviously, the purpose of the report is to outline um, a potential approach to responding to requests to take over the management and operation of private water supplies. Uh, obviously, Council will be aware that we have previous experience in this arena, having taken over the Rippendale water supply last year. Uh, this experience, along with uh, some discussion with senior Tamara, our wife staff, have helped us to shape our thinking around what we're proposing. Uh, we currently have received approaches from a number of private schemes for us to step in, um, including one who has indicated that they will actually walk away from supply later on this year. And uh, following some legal advice, uh, the confirmation is that the Water Services Act doesn't actually provide this as an option for suppliers. Rather, it makes provision for suppliers to work with Tomat ROI and others to ensure continuity of supply. Um, requiring councils to step in probably should be seen as, as a last resort and at the direction of Tomat ROI. And we do not see that as being the default response when such approaches are made. Um, there's also a certain amount of due diligence um, that we would be required to undertake to uh, get a handle on the condition of uh, these private supplies. Um, but it's likely to take up significant resources and um, probably be beyond the capacity of the current water services team. We are also dealing with our own business as usual work, as well as um, work leading up to the uh, transition to the new entity. So any of this condition assessment and uh, due diligence is, we're likely to have to call in um, external resources to help with that, which um, we would see as if there was a, a move to take that over, would the cost of that would be recoverable from the communities, rather than through the general repairs. The position is to encourage Tomat ROI to use some of the statutory tools that they've got their availability to support these supplies, rather than rely as council on council to to step in. When we are approached directly, we will first request that comprehensive information suppliers on uh, asset data and condition, and um, we can discuss with Tamara ROI um, as we feel the need to. Um, I think our preferred approach is to actually empower these communities to work with contractors and others and take over control of these supplies, bearing in mind that a lot of them have got four years to register with Tomat ROI and then another three years to actually comply with the requirements of the uh, drinking water standards and the uh, water services bill, uh, water services act. But the costs associated with that approach are likely to be uh, less than what it would be if we were to step in and take control of those. As a minimum, I think we would be required to provide sort of safe potable water uh, as an immediate um, uh, intervention. And we see that potentially as tankering in water from a registered supply. The table on 
page 284 of your agenda shows some indicative costs around that. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that it's, it's, it's not a cheap option. Um, and as, as I've touched on, you know, uh, these communities have a certain amount of time to register and an extension to comply. So that's that, that's a message that we will be looking to get out to those communities as well if if we are approached. So I guess in summary, what we are proposing is that we request to Matt ROI to use their powers to support these suppliers. Otherwise, we would look to empower the communities to uh, take control rather than us immediately stepping in. Okay. I could just add to that, um, you know, that the water services activities within the district at the moment are funded by the urban people who are on our supplies. There's not a rate contribution from what these rural private supplies. And so the cost of imposition on our budgets to respond to these requests is, is actually falling on people who are already paying, not the people who are asking for the work. Um, we are seeing Tamara Arroway, they haven't been altogether helpful in this space. Um, they haven't stepped up. They're, they're, we, they found that there's something like 75,000 private supplies in New Zealand, and so suddenly um, what they anticipated might happen um, in terms of their requirements, um, they're backpedaling a little bit, and we would anticipate that there could be some changes um, to the requirements around small private supplies by the time the seven year period is up for them. So we have heard the Chief Executive of Tamara ROI at the state, at the Water New Zealand conference, that their intention is to work with small rural private supplies over the next seven years to come up with solutions that are fit for purpose for them. So we don't anticipate that they're all going to be building um, chlorination into their systems. In fact, he specifically told me that that was not what they wanted to see. Um, so I think there's a little bit of a hysteria in the community around what requirements might be for those in the future, um, and that's um, been fueled from some parts of the community too. Mm. Um, and I, I think that there'll be a bit of backing off. So we really would have just we just do not have the capacity over the next two years. Um, we we acknowledge that there are some legal requirements on council in this space, and if people walk away, then we will be required to step in, but yeah, we would really encourage that not to be the preferred option. And in some of these cases, and particularly one of them, there's only about 10 properties on that network. It's not a complex network probably to operate. Um, it, it shouldn't be seen as an easy out for property owners to put that onto council with their contracts. Thanks, Judy. Questions? Um, um, I would think that that is their own fault. Because they put it out there that yeah. everybody was going to face these enormous fines yeah. for not complying, and then all of a sudden they realised, and well, I don't think that we should be footing the bill <coughs> for that because <coughs> they have created that fear and hysteria yeah. and are further fueling it by not coming out and saying what isn't what isn't in. Yes, and yeah. this continual, oh, you know, in seven years' time it may or may not be you, is not actually helpful at all. But I just wondered around that twenty thousand dollar for a five thousand litre tank, where that has come from. But the thirty thousand litre tank is six thousand dollars. Yeah. I just wanted to check if, if that included um like some sort of old Placing. treatment plant on it or something. Like that. <laughs> I'm not too sure. I got a Philip is estimate. Um uh, now that could be sort of the, the top end of it. Um could it possibly also include some sort of um, filtration or UV treatment. The UV or something on yeah. it, right. Yeah. Stephen, so are we making the assumption, I'm looking at when you particularly about the water delivery and the tank and everything else, so are we making the assumption that when somebody says they're going to cut it off, that there'll be no water supply? So if that happens, then we have a legal oh, I can direct us to provide the water. Yeah. Um, so we, we're not, what we're not completely clear about is whether we have to provide treated water or not. And if we have to provide treated water, then we'll be tankering water from Homolta Terrace. And there's only a couple of registered tankers in 
entire district is this like in Southland lots of people use rainwater as their water source and so there's a business opportunity for tankers in Southland when there's no rain for a period of time but in Central Otago people don't go with rainwater because that's not a viable option so yes, they, there's two issues here yeah. there's water supply and it doesn't meet the drinking water standard yeah so we don't actually know at the moment they don't have to meet the New Zealand drinking water standards we couldn't quite figure out whether we would have to or we stepped in. Small providers don't have to meet the drinking water standards up to what level? So they, they have a requirement to um, provide safe water <coughs> and like they can be prosecuted if they provide unsafe water but um, they have to be registered and they don't have to meet the New Zealand drinking water standards. Why have we got people going around that community telling people you have to or you can eat prosecuted and yeah, be in all small rural yeah. communities? That's not helpful at the moment. It's not because people are getting very angry about yeah. it and talking about taking people off supplies because in yeah. the town that I live in there's a lot of people relying on other people's water. What I would say is that I had spent time with the Chief Executive of Tamara ROA about this time a year ago and then again just recently at the Water New Zealand conference and the um, the conversation a year later was very different to what we. So the, yeah, that, that, they've spent a lot of time trying to understand the issues and they kind of realised that um, it's going to take a bit more than they had anticipated. So I guess it's pretty fair that uh, it's a major unintended consequence of how this has all been played out again coming down the line from central government. You don't have to answer that, that's all right, that's my comment, that's fine. I just have to put that in there, just saying. Um, and I fully accept what you guys are saying uh, as well. Um, my concern is a little bit, and maybe it's a little bit different, is that we've potentially set a touch of precedent along some course of action. And um, I was really um, happy to hear, Julie, that with what you're doing, and I guess it's what, what are we doing as a council and what can we do as a council? Um, to help uh, a look up, uh, make sure our community is better informed, but also to help steer and advise uh, the powers that be about actually what goes on. We're, we're a community of a huge amount of private, small and medium mm -hmm. kind of size okay. private supplies, and that's it affects so many people in our district. Uh, one of the challenges we've had recently when we've approached to Mata Arawai about these supplies is. Um, uh, they've backed off so quickly, it's been fascinating um, because they, they don't have the resources or the, or the processes in place to deal with any of this. So that their, their immediate response is they don't have to do anything for seven years. We do not see what the problem is at this point. Um, and it's like that it doesn't help when I'm getting the phone calls from the suppliers and we want to know what we need to do. Um, yeah, so, so we're kind of caught in the middle of this. So that's why that resolution has that we will write to Tamara Arawai and ask them to use the tools at their disposal because I think that that the comment that uh, was made by um, Tim was completely um, right, that they have kind of stirred up the pot and now they're ducking for yeah. power. Yeah. Um, I think Tamara Arawai is a national uh, assessment of the amount of private supplies was significantly lower than what has actually come to the fore now, which has changed the way of thinking around this pretty considerably. Yeah, and hopefully that will follow through. And just backing up what Tracy's saying, it's not a perverse outcome that we might be burning carbon in, a, in the current you know, scenario that that involves getting water to a place that's always had perfectly good water. And my understanding is that there was a thought in Wellington there might be about seven and a half thousand of these scams, and they've got 75,000. They're still getting it's, it's just yeah. ridiculous. It's absolute madness to be saying that schemes of the size of the one that we're dealing with at the moment, 13 houses, is going to have this outcome based on some theoretical gold plated standard that's come out of Wellington. It's just a nonsense. And I hope that the government looks closely at the rural, what was it, the rural supplies technical working group where they said, look, you, you need to really look at. 25 to 50 people and wonder whether this level of scrutiny is warranted or is warranted straight away. And, and again, the government followed this up with a completely, well, in terms of rural supplies, a non-existent public information campaign, really. Um, I'm not sure whether that's better or worse than the one they did on the three waters. So 
this falls back on Wellington, but the solution we've got here is about what we can do realistically, and it's a really poor solution, but it's the only one we've got. And I think that needs to go really loud to come out of Adelaide, and it needs to go really loud to the Minister as well. Uh, what, what I would say, one of the things we are doing is, as we're looking at those um, water supplies in our rural township, we are now broadening the scope of those investigations to look at what um, may need to be provided in the future to enable private water supplies to hook into those in those areas. So um, we, that's why we're back re-looking at the business case, because if you start looking at the water supply for Omicau and you say we're just servicing the size of Omicau as, as it is today, it's the kind of solutions you start looking at are quite different if you say if we have to pick up private water supplies in the Springvale area out to Omicau, it could be quite a different solution or so. So we are doing that work, and, and I think by the time these private water supplies are required to comply, with, um, there will be solutions available for them, but we're just not there yet. But it doesn't help with the private water supplies groups in this community running around and, and irrigation companies being providers of a lot of them and getting wrong information. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, and I don't know how you fix that, whether there is a, we have responsibility to come out with how the rules are for the next seven or eight years in a format or let the communities know. But there's legal firms running around and saying you're required to do this, to do that, and it's like a gravy train and confusing the average owner of the water right. Well, I guess that's actually you know, it's because they can't get the information. Yeah. They're just yeah. it's the reading and coming up with the conclusion based on the information available, which is incomplete. Yeah, they're, so, they're actually filling a role that the government should have filled. Yeah, and, actually, they're not, and they're just putting fear. Yeah. It's not very nice at some stage either because people get that's what gets people angst. So just as a note, Federated Farmers there, uh, and I'm not a member of Federated, well, I am, but the Fruit Farm, but. Um, Federated Farmers' submission was for the water services to it was that rural supplies under 50, um, 50 households and under would be um, excluded from all of this. Not excluded from safe drinking water, just excluded from all the other bits and pieces around. And it's starting to tend back towards maybe not 50 might not be the magic number, but what you're saying is there is a number that does. I think there's a move to opening. There's an opening of lines to yeah. that kind of that wasn't there. Yeah. Um, can I just clarify the bit about the provider of last resort? So, um, not ROI may afford us. They don't have to. No, that, that we like a water supplier can come to us and say we are walking away. You have to take yeah. over. To to ROI need to um be a party to that yeah. and direct us to take over. Yeah, but but, but the, the words in the report say may, so they may they may not equally as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then I guess if if they do, then it doesn't say that we can't charge the oh, cost on the, those people. Yeah. So that the act very clearly says that we can recover all. Yeah. Because you said earlier about you know how in effect now. Those on rural supplies, in some ways, probably um, a lot of council time and effort has been spent on them when there's no funding coming from them towards it. That is what it is. It's not uncommon, and you know, it's, it's about the greater good. So I think we can get over it. Um, yeah, thanks for clarifying on that. Um, and my other point was back to um, um I'm looking for. That's all right. I'll park that in the window and I'll remember it. Judy, in your view, if this, these recommendations were passed today, they'll be, that will enable you to get some communications that are clear and straightforward um, out of the public space? Um, that was what I was going to ask. I think what we might go back to Tamara Arawa and ask them if they are able to come into the area and provide some. Um, presentations or whatever around around us because I think um, there's such by like reading the law to the letter, which is absolutely what they should do, but um, it's not the kind of messaging we're hearing from tomorrow at the moment. So but I think that I think we council need to be very careful to interpret what we're hearing from Tamara so Arawa and, and put that yeah. out there as good advice. Mm -hmm. And it's really not us to pressure to tell us otherwise. Yeah. 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 That's, what I was going to, that's what I was going back to, is that I think it's really important that today 
we find some way of making that happen. Um, Sarge is dead right, we need to be careful, it's not us getting incorrect, but we should be asking um, tomorrow why to say, you need to stop this misinformation that's out there and help the community. So it can't, it can't just be us. Well, Bill Baker has come twice to Queensland in the last couple of months, so he's, he's wanting to do it. They've got a huge number of experiences. But at least we can, if, if this yeah, passes, we, yeah. we can now approach the water regulator with some protocols in place from our point of view. Because they're putting half page adverts. Is it them that's putting half page adverts? Is it not an ROI that's doing that in the half? Is one of the trades that eating? Yeah, three water stuff. Is that for them? I haven't seen it. I don't know. So there's, there's information being passed out. So that's the OT. OK. So to me, this just makes sense. It's so explanatory, straightforward, and this is what we can do to deal with what is an ongoing problem. So, am I going to move it for recommendations A through to H? I'll move that. Stephen, seconded by Taman. Any further discussion? All those in favour? Aye. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Uh, we move on to item 32.5.30, which is an addendum agenda items, so you have to go to your other set of council papers. And We have the Water Services Entity Bill, and we have Julie who will enlighten us. Okay, so I'll just do a bit of a summary. Um, so the, the bill is going to establish the four publicly owned product, uh, publicly owned, that was a Freudian slip, wasn't it? Um, water Services Entities that will provide the water, wastewater and stormwater services in place of councils from the 1st of July 2024. It contains the ownership, governance and accountability arrangements for the new entities. Um, it does also contain the arrangements that will be put in place during the transition period and that's on a schedule at the back of the um, So this is actually the first in an expected package of legislation and further legislation is expected in the coming months. Um, that, that, though, that extra legislation will provide the detail relating to the transfer of the assets, the liabilities and other matters. Um, from councils to the new entity. So this doesn't get into the detail of how the transfer is going to happen and come, come later. Um, there'll be another uh, bill that will provide the specific powers and responsibilities in the functions that we currently have to the entities. Um, so that'll be include amendments to the local government act and rights, and it'll also include the pricing and charging arrangements. We're expecting another one around economic regulation and consumer protection regimes and there could be changes to um, treaty settlement legislation to transfer the obligations that we currently have around engaging with EW on three waters to the new entities. Um, so this bill has large sections relating to the governance, the management and asset management planning and administrative requirements to those. It also covers off the transfer of the employment of staff from council to the new entities, excluding senior managers um, like myself. So, um, all the staff who predominantly work in that three waters area of council are guaranteed jobs and the new entities um, on terms that are as favourable, at least as favourable as they currently have. Um, and of specific interest is actually the requirement on the DIA to oversee council's agendas and decisions of the transition period and it'll be really interesting to see how that plays out because um, what that's probably going to mean is that we're not going to be as agile and being able to respond to decisions of council um, because there'll be, there'll be another process to get approval for those. So there's a really tight time frame of one month to submit on the bill and the timing of the submission period along with the timing of this council meeting um, has meant that staff have been unable to prepare proposed submission for you to consider today. 
um, it also coincides with the financial <clears throat> year, which um, was a bit unfortunate. A number of organisations that count organisation that councils affiliated to, such as Totoro and Local Government New Zealand, are preparing submissions on behalf of the sector. Um, and the Taiwan South and Councils have also agreed to um, share these submissions as well. Um, this is a really large um, complex that will have significant implications on our communities. Um, so the proposal on that basis is that council will start or prepare a submission and circulate councillors by next Friday, 10th of July, and then you have um, opportunity of about a week to provide feedback to us for us to get it into um, government by the um, 22nd of June. The submission will then be ratified at the council meeting on the 24th of August. This is a similar approach to that that um, Southland District Council have just taken as well. Um, we believe that it is important enough to the communities that you would want to make. Discussions, then we'll take a record of those and make sure that they're included. Um, the only thing I've really picked up looking at local government New Zealand's one was um, they were proposing um, suggesting that there be a staged process for the transition of different organisations into the entities, which does give me some cause for concern because I think the longer that uncertainty um, happens for staff, that would be really detrimental to our ability to continue to deliver because um, there will be plenty of opportunities for those staff to move elsewhere if they've been around for too long. Thank you, Judy. Just before I ask for questions or comments, I'd just like to make a comment of my own, which is really that the time given several weeks for the, this council to make a submission is just not sufficient for a bill of this complexity. Um, and really, it continues a pattern with the government's approach to three waters, which I think is a lack of consultation not acting in good faith, rushing through complex legislation, which effectively curtails the ability to consult. And for, for this organisation, it puts us under tremendous pressure to respond in a considered way, and that rushed legislation really just makes the bad law. And to add insult to injury, government has promised to reimburse councils for the extra work being demanded by such things as the the water entities bill, but it has not announced how much that will be. So we're operating with very scarce staff resource, responding to very uh, short deadlines from government with, with no idea of what reimbursement for, for the use of staff resource will be. So, it, and we've already heard in the previous item, we're dealing with private water supplies. It's just that the common themes that it's rush. They don't know. They don't have sufficient information, so they make statements, policy statements, and then have to backpedal, change. <clears throat> and I have no reason to think that the water entities bill will be any different. And for us to sit here as a council, being delivered this this, this uh, agenda item three four days ago scrambling to make a submission and, and only ratifying that submission retrospectively is just it's just not the proper way to carry out um, the creation of policy. So questions, comments? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Did you write that out to go in the resolution? Yes. I'd be happy to see it in the resolution as well. Council noted. But it's, yeah, well, it's good. Ah, yeah. It's probably too hard to a submission for picking up. I guess with the tone of the submission, I think the feeling that this table has from the community is our community doesn't want this. If we have to have it, here's our thoughts on the bill. That's actually quite <clears throat> crucial to go forward because we've said that 
and two okay to our community and for whatever reasons that didn't quite fall on deaf ears but too much other hoo-ha got the road of it and the message got lost this is another opportunity for us to take to do it again and i would expect that once again after we've done this we will actually tell our community what we've done they'll probably forget in due course but that's okay um, but we can only do what we can do um, and if but nothing else we will have been very consistent in our approach to this the whole time and um, Taylor summed it up pretty well when we were out and, and Nigel's comments at the start reflect the frustration that we're all feeling while at the same time you know we're taking an approach that says that we've been um, what's the word uh, is it conciliatory in our approach no it's helpful trying to get the best we can out of a bad deal I don't know what you like yeah well. probably the last yeah. yeah 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 they're so, designed to the inevitability to try to manage it as best as we can for the future of central table in a way that others have chosen to do it differently mm. and they've had as much success as everybody else Mm -hmm. well, you've got 42 changes through to that. Yeah. 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 Um, and I would actually add that um, the previous consideration and feedback that we backed government via the project um, of, of our fund and the report, um, you did actually get quite a few changes, or the, a, a number of the changes that we suggested have actually been incorporated into the bill. And I think in a way though that only changes within this realm can be met yeah so there were good changes to what was there but no ability to say well actually changes like this would look better i think absolutely it was within a very well confined way yeah, yeah. did i just say yeah sorry I, I just want to say comments Thank you. Is there any other useful comments you can make, or are we just going to swallow hard and? Well, yeah, we'll, we'll see what the submission looks like when yeah. it comes through. I mean, a lot of the we probably sat around here 18 months ago with all the problems that was going to come along, and slowly they're unfolding now around us. Whether it became rural drinking or what we're talking about, it's just. You summed it up in your statement before. OK, we've got a mover. I'll move. Neil, I'll just second. Cheryl, any further discussion? All those in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Carry. Now, my final comment would be that really this, this isn't a democratic process we're going through. This is really, for me, an abuse of parliamentary power. Um, and, and as I say, it's part of a, an ongoing pattern that started a year ago. Thank you. We'll move on to item number back on the main agenda. The status of the 2021-22 Water Services Capital Works Program. Um, I think we might have a slideshow. I, I was going to say, just on the, uh, the tone of the last two reports that we presented have been that's been a bit uh, this has actually been a new story. So we're going to start with a wee presentation of our project. It's video. It's um, not very long, nice and quick, um, but it's just a slideshow of the work that has actually been achieved. Not of stimulus, obviously, because that's the late down for this project. It actually has a roof now. Um, that's the tank that'll be up at the top of Clyde Hill to hold the water before it goes to Alexandra. Your, um, that's true. Uh, field. Field. Yeah. We're just aware that you don't always see how big some of these things are, how much water's gone on. So the area beside the golf course, the Dunstan Golf Course at Clarabins, the main pump station for the wastewater. So those tanks are called um, about eight hours for all of Clyde, we must mention. Some of the electrical telemetry switchboards. So, we do have a groovy little video of this that we'll put on um, our Facebook page. It's time lapse. That was a bit to put on here today. It's really good to catch the scope, the size yeah. of some yeah. of these things. So, you can see the man yeah. on there. Um, so, that, that concrete was all poured at night time in the summer because the temperature needed to be lower. 
at the 4,000 cubic meter uh, water as well. So that's four million liters of water that will hold. Do so they get filled to the top? Pardon? Do they get filled to the top of the dome? No. Yeah. Yeah. Electrical domes, top of them, solar panels. This is the um, lights and storage that we're doing for the pump station, just over behind the um, flood bank. So this was that falling rain down the hill where the helicopter came in and did the concrete floor. Bloody good job you didn't have falling man down the hill. That's steep and you cut away the trees. Mm -hmm. and it's incredible. It's almost yeah. Beautiful. And so some of these projects have been in that uh, quite hard basket for a long time, um, <laughs> quite expensive and quite hard. So we will fall under McKinley's watch too, eh? Yeah. And even there, you can see the guys beside those tanks. You know, they don't look that big when you look at them this way, but when you see people standing beside them, they are not busy. Um, and some of these projects are a bit smaller, but um, they have big impacts on the communities that are you know, serviced by them. So there's actually two clarifiers there. One's a second hand one out of Auckland. Not a lot to see on the screens because they are just uh, being finished off last week. So <laughs> preliminary work. Uh, we've actually had eight councils come here to look at these screens. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's the inflow and the outflow. Oh, okay. So you could be yeah. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll just give you the site now. Um, yeah. More? Yeah, we are not pictures, but um, oh, sorry. <laughs> you were as well as I like. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If you're so with it. <laughs> you approved a program of work up to 9.46 million in August 2020, and uh, the due date for the completion of this work program was the 30th of June. 2022 up until Friday, which was the 1st of July, uh, when we were advised that actually it's been extended now to the December because some councils have finished. So we're going to give ourselves a pat on that uh, because we have actually finished our entire program and spent every dollar of government funding that was available of it to us. Um, so of the original plan work, the one project that was related to the Imakau water treatment upgrade had to be deferred due to environmental concerns relating to our proposed water source. Um, in the Thompson's um, Creek. So staff have actually had to go back to the drawing board with Omacow Water to identify wider options that will provide an enduring water supply to Omacow, which is able to meet the needs of growth within the constraint of the care catchment. So that project for Omacow Water will be pr probably be provided to the new water entity to progress and that's likely to be a high priority for investment as it meets the highest priorities for the 2024 asset management plan. Um, we have to provide the Capital Works program for Entity D in October um, this year, so um, we're start, going to be starting to pull that list of work together quite soon. Um, so work on the contingency list for the stimulus program uh, was progressed because we were a wee bit worried that we might have had late delivery on those tanks that we know have licenses. Um, so that mitigated that risk. Um, but actually, we actually got all the tanks in and so uh, delivered the whole stimulus program, excluding the I'm a cow job, plus um, most of the contingency projects. We've been unable to uh, provide an accurate, accurate updated cost as at the 30th of June for today because we're still waiting on Gordon Hogan's claim to come in, but we have been given sort of that um, what they thought it was yesterday, which indicates that we've spent, I think we had about 900 and something thousand dollars left, and I think we've actually got a claim for about two million dollars for June. Um, mm. So that includes um, the contingency projects that are funded in the long term plan. So it's been it's good. It's, it means that our, our carry forward for this year will be substantially less than what, what it might have been. So I really just want to um, put out for, um, oh, we've got two projects that need need a little bit more done on them being the reservoir and the right since pump scheme station because the commissioning still needs to be undertaken on those. So that's an important part. 
Um, so I really just want to put out, out um, a huge shout to the um, team who pulled all this together because it's been a mass, massive undertaking. And, and also to Paul Hogan and the um, subcontractors who have worked on these projects because they've really um, pulled out all the stops for us to, to ensure that we got that um, $9.6 million spent on time. Um, and I think as a little council, we can be pretty proud of that. Absolutely. Thank you, Judy. Any comments? I just want to make one noise. You want us to walk up the Clyde Hill and have a look at the progress of the building of the treatment plant for Alex and Clyde. And I can remember when I first came in this room on the VCB in, I think, 2007, going and seeing the, one of the then bores in Alexander, and it was a tin shed pretty much the same as I've got in the backyard. It had a bore <laughs> in it. It had a drum chlorine and a wee pump that went squirt every so often. That was it. Mm. That there is just light years, even though it's only 14 years. It's just remarkable that now that we've got to meet the regulations, the size of it, the need, the size of it, um, because of growth and so forth, it's just remarkable the change in that period of time. But, th but I think, to be fair too, um, it goes back a lot further than that. Um, and Stephen and Martin will probably both give testament to the fact that we have, for as long as we've all been involved with local government, been working on our, our free waters mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a smaller way, you know, when it was community boards, digitalisation made a difference. So we've actually, um, we have almost been, um, what's the word, potentially penalised for doing better than a whole lot of others, yeah. and a way better than a whole lot of others, yeah. for many years at some considerable cost to our rate payers. Yeah. I can recall Cromwell community board rates going up double digits, three years in a row to fund this sort of stuff, as we found ways of doing it. Remember, Watts were getting money from central government because it met the, what's the, 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 the deprivation <laughs> index, you know, so I've got some money to make things happen. Um, you know, so this is just a, um, I suppose, we'll push from central government because of the failures of others have actually accelerated the program, give us a funding to make it happen, which is even better, and we're a better place. So if but nothing else happens in this whole Three Waters um, future, that we can sit back and go, actually, we didn't do too bad in terms of giving them something that was pretty good. Yeah, absolutely. Well, because we're well, we shit done. Yeah, and that's the difference. So that we're started with it as well. You go back to the early days of the McMillans and the Lives and the Cromwell Community Boards and the people there, they got stuff done and they made decisions. Simple. I, I would say that um, the districtisation of Three Borders has made a huge difference in the delivery of work across the district. Um, and I think that was a very bold step for the council to make at the time, but I think it's um, put in a good stead going forward. Um, and certainly when we look around New Zealand and we see they're still localised funding in yeah. small communities for the upgrades, that's, that's causing them similar issues. The benefits of that were undersold in the, in the, in the process by which we made that decision well undersold. Yeah. And look back and go, as much as I, others like me might be saying, so the way we did it was not the right way, the outcome is the best outcome possible. And if we just tried land, we'd have the same as off. Uh, <laughs> you could throw that last comment. <laughs> I've never heard a word. <laughs> Not but, a wrong there, but he said it was a great uh, idea just because of water. Yes. So, uh, might, might we do? Well, I've, heard it. I've said yeah. it before. No, I've said it before. But what I've said, and I'll keep on saying, is that the way we went about it, um, we undersold it, focused on the wrong things, and this, the latter councils, later councils made sure that we got the best outcomes by what we the decision we've made. It was a brilliant move. Okay. Okay. You can have lunch yeah. 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 Okay, so well, I must say my notes against this agenda item just said, well done. <laughs> well, well, and, and, and Julie's a little yeah. Patrick and the, all the staff has been, a, that's been a fantastic effort because of, we are running up right up the wire to do it and, and, and it's been done. And I'm, Pleased that you've included Fulton Hogan and the subcontractors because it's nice to hear that they've worked in because that'll put a lot, of, a lot of pressure on them as well. So I'm happy to move the report we received to over seconder. Stephen, the discussion. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you, thank you. And we go to item number 22.5.8. The Water Services Capital Works Program 2022 to 2024. Judy. Yep, so just um, showing that everything carries on. Um, so we, the, the purpose of this report is to get confirmation from councillors on the overarching objectives for delivery of the Three Waters Capital Works Program for the ne next two years. 
So typically we have a list of projects with associated funding for each project um, for delivery within a time period and where work is delayed or deferred, then that funding is carried forward into the subsequent years and LTPs to, to complete that particular project. Uh, with the expected transition of three orders to the new entity on the 1st of July 2024, uh, this carry forward would go to the new water entity, uh, most likely as a reduction in the expected levels of debt transfer. The resolutions that are in this report confirm that it is Council's objective to fully spend the capital funding that has been provided in the long term plan on three waters projects within the district prior to the 1st of July 2023. So staff have identified that there are risks in the water treatment projects that we have in our plan um, getting, um, at, and being completed by July 2024 um, and that funding allocation um, would need to be split on other projects if that happened. So these projects will continue to be a high priority for the new water entity as it is compliance with the New Zealand drinking water standards. Um, there are a number of projects in years four and five of the LTP, which I've listed in the report, which could be brought forward and progress quickly if um, some of the planned projects are delayed or deferred. Um, and just, just to give you um, an update, we are proceeding with the uh, treatment upgrade at Cromwell's water treatment plant and we have started to make some really good progress on the design. Expecting to be doing that um, within the next Construction to be started. Okay, thank you, Julie. Any comments, questions? Well, I'm just going to, and that, that <coughs> probably rising main one you talked about, and that's that's the one that's going to see the potential relocation of the chlorine treatment yeah. um, to the reservoir site and make some changes to the infrastructure that's otherwise down by the lake. Yeah. Yeah. So, what, what we had identified. Um, we, we increased the budgets in the last LTP for the treatment plant at Cromwell, recognising the complexities that we were finding on the Lake Dunstan project. Um, as we've got into the investigation on the quality of Cromwell, it draws from ground, a, a mixture of groundwater and lake water. So the water is, um, doesn't have the same levels of issues that we have at Clyde because it also doesn't have the rock flour coming through from the shore over. Um, so, that's meant that we are, uh, it's looking like we will be going to uh, filtration system, car, uh, cartridge filters rather than uh, membrane filters. Uh, and if we were to build, um, because we're, that we're building a new treatment plant, there's an opportunity to look at where that treatment plant's located. So we also had a, to put in the program to build a new dedicated rising main up to the reservoir because at the moment the water goes through the Cromwell, gets treated down by the lake, gets fed through the Cromwell network up to the reservoir. So that results in pressure fluctuations happening within the network. So this new rising main will give them a um, far more resilient um, supply up to the reservoirs. We can treat it at the reservoirs, fill the reservoirs and then um, service the town on the reservoirs. And you um, end up with a bigger retention tank as yeah. well, the whole time of the touring. Yeah, and so it means we can move the treat the bulk of the treatment activities away from the lakefront up to the treatment uh, up to the reservoir site is, which is better for security and probably better on the team. Hello. Tim. A couple of things. Just to clarify what was said previous, so the cartridge system failed in Clyde because of, I thought, primarily the Mdardia coupled with the flour. Yeah. With the yeah. flour. Yeah. Have we tested cartridge at Cromwell or that's what we're using currently or how do we know what we didn't know at, Crom at Clyde the, yeah. is the presumption that the rock flour's disappearance going to allow cartridges? Yeah. Do we know that for sure? Yeah, so that, um, what we know is that if there was to get, there's, there's nothing going into the Cromwell network. Um, there's no kind of getting into, there's nothing blocking our filters with them on the people. Right. Um, yeah. So, so they, will, they will check all of that before yeah. we yeah. make the final decision. Yeah. But it's yeah. looking we're really the budget. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, we've, we've, we've followed up on that. Yeah. 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 Sure. Oh, sorry, then. Sure. So, and that's cheaper. Yeah. yeah. So you should yeah. the treatment and rather than the full membrane filter system. I know this is sounds really weird, but technically you could have taken the Cromwell water to the treatment place and supply and get rid of the filtration. 
Uh, I think we're getting all tired here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not take a cold uh, so We're here to consider the capital works program. <laughs> <laughs> so, any further comments? Just one night, George, yep. and it's the tenant lawyer coming out and me, but in the um, recommendations we refer to entity D, it's Southern um, Water Services entity in the bill. Should we be consistent? Yeah, you could change that now. When I wrote this, yeah. I Southern I Water it. Services entity, whoever it's said entity. The bill hasn't passed, but that's what it's referred to. Yeah. Well, it it it's from the bill passed, I'm sure. And it won't it's be a slide to me either, I'm sure. We could just say new water entity. Yeah. Mm. Well, yeah, because it will change again. New water, new water entity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, it seems to me it's self-evident that we should approve this, these recommendations. It's in the, certainly in the best interests of our rate party community. So do I have a mover for A, B, C, D and E? In. Neymar, any, you're out of it. Any further discussion? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'll not keep the discussion for lunch. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Aye. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Yeah. Finishes yeah. Good point. Good point. Good point. Good point. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you very much. We're um, progressing. <laughs> I think we'll push on a little bit and um, still sort of keep roughly where we are. I'm presuming, Michelle. Oh, okay. So she made it. Yeah. 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 Along, all right, we're going to jump to page 409 to the Remuneration Authority determination. Then we'll go to my report from the Probably go for lunch then, depending on how long it takes. So, um, one, this is your report, page 409, Remuneration Authority determination for 2022. Can I steal Wayne's thunder? Hey? No. Okay, I'll shut up then. Yeah. What's that? Nothing. He's going to move it. Oh. Well, you can, if you like. Um, that big one with me. Um, so, okay. Um, okay, so we're passing the um, uh, determination through from the Remuneration Authority. A uh, reminder um, that they set it and it's not actually available for discussion um, as such. <laughs> Funny that. Um, there's two, um, uh, two parts to the determination this time. Uh, part one is from July uh, 1, 2022, so a couple of days ago, uh, to the election, and then there'll be a further uh, increase uh, after the election. Um, and there's just been a, a couple of uh, changes uh, which I want to add into the elected members allowance and reimbursement policy. And if I go down to... The, um, okay, so there's been some changes to um, the information and technology allowances, what you could... Um, uh, claim uh, there's been a clarification uh, on vehicle mileage when vehicle mileage is calculated. So if someone was to live, um, if the member was to live outside the area, then it only gets calculated when they actually get into the central area. So if you have the lines, you can claim the value of those junction. For instance, um, and what I've done uh, in the um, in the appendix. Uh, I was hoping to show you those changes, um, but it doesn't seem to have uh, wanted to do that for me in the um, appendix. So I've got it here, up on the board. Um, so here are the uh, <clears throat> here are the proposed changes for um, this policy. Um, so first one was um, uh, if you're going to um, uh, want to be reimbursed for costs, you have actually show us what they are. Seems fair enough, I suppose. Um, a few changes um, to Kurka. Yeah, I was thinking that. That's what I saw too. So what's that? If I go up there, I've been Kurka. That's right. I'm reading that. Yeah. Well, well, travel council, but it does. It says out. given frequent travel requirements for the oh, while. I think you'll find that's the mayor. That's the mayor. Didn't know that, did you? It's madness. I wouldn't be seen. Doesn't believe in it. Uh, <laughs> you wouldn't be. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 you're a 
to meet the man that told you probably shot you a meal. Sorry, Wayne, you were saying before these. Uh, uh, there's a few changes there on uh, allowances for um, provision of uh, IT uh, stuff there, and <clears throat> uh, that one there. Um, so if you're if, if there's a, a member who's living uh, outside the district, then they can only uh, claim mileage when they actually get into the district if they're doing something for the council. I'm lucky I managed to cover pay short of high. <laughs> and finally, the uh, other change is just the reimbursement um, uh, of uh, travel time moving up from $37 to $40 an hour. So those are. Oh, uh, to travel there. <clears throat> so put it in. Hmm? She did pay for that. And they're not backdated either. What? No, no, put a few in. I think it's a travel. Nine years ago, it was my So, anyway, so my, um, the, the, the recommendations that I put up there is um, <laughs> they just note um, that new determination, which will be backdated the six days uh, uh, for this um, uh, initial round. About 2% is um, the line between now and the election. Um, and then um, I'm also asking if you could approve those uh, changes which I've shown there uh, to the allowances and reimbursement policy. Well, I'll move that. Oh, yeah, I'm sharing, aren't I? Thanks, Jim. Yeah, um, I'll move that. Yeah, I'll move that. Yeah, I'll move that. I'm so used to jumping in when it's not my turn. I'm trying yeah, to do yeah, yeah. it not to. Sure. Thank you, Stephen. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against, that's carried. Thank you, Wayne. And you ain't done a presentation, so we can only read it. home. on to my report. Um, last month, Sancho and I attended the local government New Zealand rural and provincial sector meeting, and that was the first time we've been together in probably over a year, and it was um, it was fairly interesting, to so say the very least. Um, Minister Mahudu, as you'd expect, spoke on three waters, um, and I've mentioned there, I've, and, and it will be in our submission, I'm sure, that there's still no mention of standardisation or even harmonisation of pricing within the entities. And that was, you know, the basic guts of what um, these reforms are intended to be about, is that there'll be benefits to smaller places with uh, the, the, the scale of the bigger places is supposed to be one of the drivers of it. So. I, I asked the question, um, there's talk of the perhaps, perhaps it will be in the economic um, legislation to come, but um, I couldn't get a guarantee that it will be. So that's something we've really, really got to keep our eye on. And, and particularly here, because we, under the Aurora Customised Price Path, we fought the fight to have the electricity authority say, right, whatever your line charges are in Dunedin is going to be the same in Alexandra. We failed, we lost. And that's a, that's a, a government philosophy or, or Government's the wrong word. A bureaucratical philosophy in the electricity market that the costs will be they like. That's one monopolised um, utility. So is water. So it makes me awfully nervous, and I intend to keep um, right on top of it. Um, Minister Park has spoken on resource management act reforms, um, and as I say, these are you've know, got the potential to be more impactful than the water reforms. So just not on people's radar as much. Um, there had been talk and. I think it was an LGNZ seminar and where we were told that the regional planning committees had to be membership limited to currently elected members. Minister Parker confirmed that was not the intention at all. So if you have a, for example, a former elected member who's got the time and the ability to sit on that group for you and they're the best person for the job, then you can use them or whatever, a member of the public um, outside of council. It would be for the councils to still determine who that person would be though. So I thought that was useful, as was the conversation I had later on with him, where um, we both got fairly excited about the ability to issue infringement notices if need be for people who continually put the wrong thing in the wrong wheelie bins, because at the moment we've only got that very blunt tool of taking the wheelie bins off them, um, which is just going to lead to inappropriate disposal, most probably. So it's nice to uh, hopefully we'll keep we'll watch this space, but there may be the opportunity. And again, it would be as a now second to last resort. To, um, to issue a ticket, so to speak. Simon Watts spoke, opposition spokesperson on local government. I found him to be a very good speaker, actually. Um, he's only been in the role six months, spoke very well. He didn't have notes, he just covered everything. Um, 
<coughs> the note was that National will repeal and replace the three waters legislation, and I put the emphasis on replace for those who think that things are just going to carry on if three waters is kicked out, they're not. There's going to be changes of some type. Um, and, and as I said, the, that philosophy is that government would fix the things that are most wrong, but as we've just commented on, we've done a bloody good job in Central Otago, so our people wind up through their taxes, pay for those who don't. And I get a, can't get equally excited about that as, um, as the other proposals. I think that's just rewarding bad behaviour and leaving those councils in charge. Don't like that idea. Um, one that doesn't directly affect us, and it doesn't, it doesn't, was Wairoa. And Wairoa is a place of 9,000 people, and I'm, I've been there, and I wouldn't say it's perhaps the most affluent of communities either. They tried to change their rating policies they're entitled to do, to move to capital value rates and away from fixed charges. And as part of that, um, they were going to hit the roading costs higher, which was going to hit the forestry supplier. They've taken them all the way to the High Court, and the Wairoa District Council has won on every point, but they're still sitting with, um, I think it was, Sanchi, do you remember, it was $25,000 or $50,000 in outstanding costs, even after they got costs award? I think it was fifty. Yeah, it was a lot. Um, and they've still got the potential for an appeal to come. So I'd, I'd put it to LGNZ that the organisation should be given some support here, because otherwise the little councils are going to be the ones that get picked off by big, big industry in cases like this, and that could be us one day. So I feel that even though this isn't directly on our point, um, if there's going to be any point for the organisation, it should be to support each other. So um, the New Zealand implement that, or is it Mayor and CEO to chip in? Well, I think it comes to the overall body to, to put a fighting fund together for these sort of things. I don't know what they look at, see what their finances are like, but they should be supported. Uh, I'd rather I'd rather not come to you and say, hey, can yeah. we have five thousand yeah. dollars to do it? But if they don't, then maybe it is something that we talk about because I think that we need to, particularly our small councils, need to support each other. Um, so, Tim, is that is something actually going to happen? Go to the LGNZ. Well, I'll be talking to people at National Council at conference and following up with Mayor Craig Little. Um, I actually suggested to give a little page. I thought that was one of the best puns ever, but no. Give a little. Yeah, Mayor Little. little, little, little. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, Please smack you all. But um, yeah, I'll definitely be following up with it. And, and he, he, he and I have been having discussions afterwards saying, well, you know, let's see how this goes. I'm sure that something does happen. One way or the other. Um, I attended the New Zealand stakeholders meeting in Auckland. This is, I think, the third one. Is it the second or the third? Can't remember. We didn't used to get invited, but we now do. So it used to be if you had an airport that Air New Zealand flew into, then you got to go to these meetings. Okay. But they've now put a handful of other places that they see as significant to their tourism operation offering, and we're a part of that. <laughs> we're going to have an airport. So yeah. They did. Uh, we were, the, I think, the first council they chose that didn't have an airport. It was before there was any announcement of future plans for this part of the world. Yeah, I did ask <laughs> the comments of the CEO on his thoughts about Paris Airport, and the boy should be in politics because it shows how I didn't get an answer. <laughs> <laughs> Got a lot of words, but and, and look, that's understandable. Um, they're a, a consumer of airports, and so they're in an interesting position. Coffee and chats around the district. How rude to time out at the little red coffee shed, just yarning the people. Um, what a neat place. Numbers were down, but with the amount of people that are sick in the community, it's not surprising. Uh, attended a great day at the Lindus catchment group and several members of the LRC. Really good work up in the Lindus for um, removing willows and putting in um, natives. And the idea of moving the willows is, I think they said, 60 litres of water a day for every willow. So if you've got a, a river that's under pressure, rip them out. But it was interesting to see this. There was a lovely little tributary going into the river. Lovely native plantings, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Willow tree, brilliant, brilliant, uh, another willow tree. And I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, you couldn't use a willow stick to hold your um, fishing rod because it would ground to a tree. But they're there to protect the trout. So you know, I'm glad we look after our invasive pests so very well. Invasive hey, is one of them sort of protected under an act of parliament that all look. One tastes good. The possums tasted this good one. You know. <laughs> It just annoys me. I, I really get upset when I see because those those willows are just going to dry over time, take back over and ruin all the school. At least they take them out when the other natives are established. And they may well be. Yeah. Let's be fair. Oh, the worst thing is when they do take them out, they leave them behind and they break bridges afterwards. Just yeah. saying. 
Well, that, that's one of the things too. They, they've, they've done a good job of moving them away from where the river will come, but it's still there and finding a, a, a means to utilise that and put Quinton on to the, the guy to see if there's any use we can find for them. Um, but it, it is a resource just sitting there, just not in a, the most convenient place in the world. But, you know, I'll, 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 I'll just make one comment on Willows. They took him out above the main road in Wedderburn. And if we talk to former councillor Becker, there's something like 80 metres tall from above the main road, Wedderburn to Turhill Town. And where the willows came out, the big floods took a massive gravel sprees. Mm -hmm. And now the farmers are going back and putting willow plantings, different willows, admittedly. But when those plantings all come out at once, the rivers change and the gravel flows. And that was to fill in a lot of our gold. So mm -hmm. there may be a method of leaving 10% of <laughs> there, and then as they establish the other plants, take them out. But getting some other plants. Once they all come out at one hit, you end up with very, very high risk. Actually, if I just yeah. Oops. And also, the and the I've enjoyed the roundabouts in Cromwell because it makes it a hell of a lot easier. And uh, the thing of my first navigation series. <laughs> 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 you have to go around the park twice. <laughs> I hope you go around the right way. I, I do. I have seen people get them wrong. They're remarkable. Um, people still struggling to understand how to indicate a person. Um, Matariki, I found it a really rewarding um, attending a Matariki celebration, and that weekend finished with uh, dinner prepared by the um, Niva men who have learned cooking skills under a government program um, to teach them. Um, the skills they didn't have, and we had the string band play, which I hadn't heard for ages. So I'm hoping I'm having a word to the new um, boss of Seasonal Solutions, Sean Fogarty, that we might be able to get those string bands back. So just thinking, you know, in Clyde or at Old Cromwell Town, when all the all the tourists are here riding the bike trail, excellent. So that's my report. Happy to answer any questions. Any comments? No. Okay, in that case, I'll move my report. Or we'll second it. Neil will second it. And thank you. What we'll do now is we'll break for lunch. Um, let's at, at quarter past one. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lily. Thank you. Sure.